far-right Israeli groups plan to march to East uh, Jerusalem. The march happened soon after Israel's new Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, took office. The world's only Jewish state now has a coalition government led by an ultra-right nationalist leader. We, uh, what should the world expect from Israel's new Prime Minister? Well, to discuss this further, we're joined uh, by Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, an international affairs researcher at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Matambo, thank you for making the time to speak to us uh, today. Uh, your yesterday, uh, the Israeli Parliament uh, put into uh, operation the new leadership. What, in, as a person who's interested in these kind of matters, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, Israel, a walk with Jewish nationalist Naftali Bennett at the head of a new coalition government. What does it mean for the country? What does it mean for South Africa and for the rest of the world? Good morning, Desiree, and good morning to your, to your viewers. Thank you for inviting me. Well, first of all, we have to look at the person that Naftali Bennett is a tech uh, millionaire who uh, was actually a United States citizen up to the year 2013. Not only that, when he became more involved in Israeli politics in 2006, he was actually the chief of staff of the outgoing prime minister, Mr. Benjamin uh, Netanyahu. And then he also served as recently as 2020 as the Minister of Defense in Netanyahu's cabinet. So you would expect that, um, yes, there will be some continuation of some of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's policies because they also both belong to, to the right wing of Israeli politics. And not only that, Naftali Bennett has actually been demonized by those who followed him before because they think as if he's now an apostate of his own values. He was supporting Netanyahu, but then after the the four elections that have been held in the last two years have failed to create any long strategic view of the country. That is why he formed this marriage of convenience with uh, with, with some centrist parties such as Yeshit Atid and then also Ram and an Arab party. So this is a marriage of, of convenience. We should expect that as Prime Minister, he will continue some of Netanyahu's policies, but then of course there will be some checks and balances because his term will only be for two years and then uh, he, he Lapid will take over from there. Now that uh, there's a coalition in place, should South Africa change its posture towards Israel? I don't think so at the moment, because we have to look at Naftali Bennett as a right, as an ultra-rightist politician. So how much power is he going to wield? That is what we will probably have to, 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 to look at, because leading up to the Sunday, Sunday election of uh, Naftali Bennett as a prime minister, there were some ground that the rightists and the, and the centrists as well had given to start. For example, there will be more investment in the, in the areas that are in the areas that are dominated by, by Arabs and in some areas where there is a very big demo, uh, the Arab demographic within Israel itself. So if Naftali Bennett will honor those particular premises, then we'll see a softening of South Africa's politics. But then if he will continue being in the mold of Benjamin Netanyahu for a long time was his mentor, then we will see that there will be the, the, the continuation of South Africa's policy on Israel, which is, of course, more amenability towards the, cause, the, the Palestinian cause, and then, of course, against the, 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 the right-wing sector of, of Israeli politics. But then, at the end of the day, not only South Africa, we have to look at the United States as being the biggest partner, the most important partner of Israel, and Israel's stance itself being obviously its preoccupation with Iran. So we have to look at South Africa's policies within that broader, broader scope of, uh, of Israeli's policies. Can we see another comeback from Benjamin Netanyahu? I, I wouldn't be so hasty as to write a political obituary for Benjamin Netanyahu because this was actually his second stint as Prime Minister. He was Prime Minister from 1996 up to 1999, and then he was defeated by Ehud Barak. After that, he went into opposition politics. He had actually temporarily resigned uh, from active politics. He came back and then became the longest serving Prime Minister that Israel has ever had. Even he, when he was voted out of power, uh, most recently now by Naftali Bennett, he was defiant as usual and said, well, if destiny rules that we will be in opposition politics, then so be it. We are ready for that. So he's still in a fighting mode and uh, we could still see a comeback for him because he has a lot of sympathy from right-wingers.
When we were reporting on the new parliament coming in, we were talking about how the coalition has a uh, opted to stay away uh, from the Palestinian-Israeli question and focus mainly on uh, uh, economic growth in the country and the fight against COVID-19. Uh, will we see them tackle this at any point? Because it is topical. Inevitably. Inevitably, they have to do so. And um, Palestine itself, because of its own internal affairs, the postponement of an election, Hamas enjoying so much power as well in the in the Gaza, in the Gaza enclave, we'll see that as being a very big preoccupation of of Israel. And of course, the new coalition government is on fragile ground. So they will try by all means to pacify the rightists. They will take up a hardline stance on Israel, on, on, on Palestine, sorry, and then to make sure that they keep uh, Benjamin Netanyahu from coming into power, they'll make sure that they, they further the corruption cases that he has he has been facing in the courts of law. So yes, they can procrastinate all they want by looking at preoccupations such as mending their relationship with the United States, making sure that they keep Iran's nuclear ambitions in check, but then there will always be the specter of Palestine hanging in the, in the background. What does this mean for uh, Netanyahu's corruption case going forward and also the fact that he was so close to former U.S. President Donald Trump and uh, this doesn't seem to uh, have uh, stood him in good stead anyway? Yes, historically, historically, the, uh, the Democratic Party has been against uh, right-wing Israel, Israeli politics. So we would say under President Joe Biden that there would be a more firmer stance on, on any right-wing elements. Uh, so if Netanyahu had continued as a prime minister, then we would have expected that there was going to be a hacking back to the frosty relationship that Netanyahu had shared with President Barack Obama. But now that that is gone as well, Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, will have to answer for his for his corruption cases and it will depend also how forceful is he going to be in demonizing the incoming prime minister if he's going to be that 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 forceful then of course we will expect that uh, there, there will be an acceleration of his of his corruption cases not only to demonize him but to make sure that they prevent a netanyahu comeback as he did uh, after the, the accident to the prime ministership for the second time Today's march by the far-right uh, Israeli groups, how is it likely to be interpreted by the Palestinian side, particularly the militant factions such as Hamas? That, first of all, the Palestinians cannot just rest on their laurels just because there's an Arab party forming the, uh, the, the part of the coalition government. They won't even have any representation in the cabinet anyway. So this just shows that there is a continuation of rightist uh, movement, rightist feeling, uh, Naftali Bennett himself is an avowed rightist. That is why I keep emphasizing the fact that uh, his, uh, his his marriage of convenience is on very shaky ground. That's why even up to Sunday, we are not quite sure actually if Netanyahu would be uh, squeezed out of power because he still enjoys the majority, the, a, a lot of support. The majority that the coalition in, uh, won was very thin. I think a vote of about 60, 59 to, to, to 60 or something like that. So we should look at the march in that particular context to say there is actually a continuation of right-wing feeling. There will be more pummeling of Hamas as long as even Palestine itself does not get its house its house in order. So there will be that continuation of rightist feeling. And uh, of course, they have the new prime minister who is sympathetic to their cause. We thank you very much for talking to us on Israel, but uh, just to, for the, we're going to take benefit of having you here and talk about other broader international issues. The uh, NATO meeting currently underway and uh, the stunts of the U.S. against China and Russia. What are your thoughts about what's happening uh, in Brussels? That was expected. It was actually going to be very strange if the United States especially did not take a hardline stance on, on China and um, and Russia. And that is because, of course, after uh, Russia's expulsion from, from the G8, after it, uh, it, it, it gained the Crimean Peninsula, we've seen a hardening of, of Russian militancy. And that, in 2014, happened almost at the same time, just a, a year after uh, President Xi Jinping of China gained power. And we have seen that under Xi Jinping, we are, we, are, we, are, we are faced with a China that is not timid. We are faced with a China that he himself, President Xi Jinping, said should not only be ready to fight wars, but should be ready to fight wars and win wars. And of course, 
We are seeing that China wants to have suzerainty of the South China Sea, and that has actually presented China in a very bellicose light. So I'm not surprised that Joe Biden took that particular hardline stance. Donald Trump was all about rhetoric, but underneath he was actually more amenable to people like uh, Kim Jong-un, people like uh, Vladimir Putin, people like uh, Xi Jinping. Benjamin, Donald Trump wanted to be in the league of the of the world strongmen, so to say. Unfortunately, that has that, that, that era has gone for, for, for China. Now we have seen that uh, the Democrats will be more forceful in trying to cut down uh, Russia and uh, China's ambitions. Let's just talk about South Africa's uh, role uh, in the past week, uh, participating in the G7 conversations. Uh, but on the other hand, being a part of BRICS and uh, the very countries that are being admonished, uh, South Africa valuing as a part of uh, their partners in the BRICS uh, uh, group of nations. Well, so that actually dates back to the early 1990s when the ANC government was almost taking power. It positioned itself uh, ideologically the way it is positioned geographically. South Africa is in between the east, of course, it's in between the west, and then even economically, it was always Africa's uh, most industrialized economy. So in its diplomacy, it has it has had to be very dangerous for the, for the last 27 years. At the end of the day, if you look at South Africa's foreign policy, it was, it was crafted in the 1990s. The ANC's solidarity was, first of all, to Africa. Apart from Africa, it, it had a layered kind of a foreign policy diplomacy. It, it, its first port of call was Southern Africa, then Africa, then the developing world, then its relationship with the West. But then it also uh, had to adhere to the fact that if South Africa had to improve its economy, then it needed uh, a more formidable relationship with the West, where much of the revenue, much of the foreign direct investment used to come from. But at the end of the day, you cannot ignore an increasingly growing China, a China that always prides itself as a voice of the historically third world, so to say. So I'm not surprised with the role that South Africa is playing. It is just diplomatic uh, pragmatism. Well, let's thank you very much uh, for your thoughts and your time.